I'm Kate, and on this episode of Bite Size, we're exploring peppers and capsaicin, which is the molecule behind spice. So first, we're going to dig into some biology by looking at the pepper itself and understanding what's going on in your body when you actually experience spice. And then we're going to experiment with how to relieve spice based on both scientific studies and capsaicin's molecular structure. Chili peppers are a wide group of plants that all belong to the genus Capsicum. Within this genus, there are more than 200 varieties, 30 species, five of which are domesticated. All right, quick trivia. How many of these peppers do you think you can name? Hint, some are spicy and others are mild. All right, here's the big reveal. And more interestingly, almost all of these peppers belong to a single species, the anum species. Did we miss one of your favorite peppers? Let us know in the comments. How spicy a pepper is isn't just due to its genotype. In fact, the maturity and how the pepper is cultivated, so the amount of water and sunlight as well as the air temperature, can actually impact how spicy it is. Additionally, different parts of the pepper have more spice than others. A lot of people think it's in the seeds of the pepper, but actually the membrane around the seeds is the spiciest part. So while not all peppers have that spice, the genus name gives a hint for that spicy molecule capsaicin, which is part of a broader group of molecules called capsaicinoids. So what exactly is capsaicin? Here's its chemical formula and structure. You'll notice that it's primarily made up of carbon and hydrogen, and there's a ring and a tail. And this structure, which we'll dig into more later, will impact how we can cook with it and how we get relief from the heat. So we're going to focus on capsaicin in food, but it actually has other uses, which we are totally surprised by. Any guesses? Here's a hint. But you're going to have to check out our supplementary materials to learn more about that. The Scoville unit is probably the most well-known way that we measure spice, but now there are more advanced technologies like high liquid performance chromatography, and these methods look at the amount of capsaicin in parts per million. To convert from Scoville unit to parts per million, we need to divide the Scoville unit by 16. Most peppers have a range of Scoville units, so we took the average of that and then divided it by 16 to get parts per million in capsaicin for each type of pepper. Now, we can actually sense one part per million of capsaicin. That's how strong it is. And to give you a sense of how little one part per million is, it's the same as one inch and 16 miles or one cent and $10,000. But what makes it so potent and powerful? What's actually going on in our body when we experience something that's really spicy? Well, it all has to do with our sensory neurons, which send signals to our brain that we're basically experiencing pain. And these neurons are found throughout your body, including your mouth. Capsaicin binds to these sensory neurons, triggering a series of processes in the cell, which send a message to your brain, you're feeling the burn. Now that spice and pain sensation picked up by our sensory neurons triggered by the capsaicin is... Well, not generally wanted in most animals, and in fact, it gives the peppers a natural defense. Studies have actually shown that some insects don't lay eggs in these plants, and that rodents often avoid these plants as well. Interestingly, there's one animal that isn't really bothered by it. Birds. There are a couple different theories as to why. The first has to do with sensory neurons. Birds just don't have as many sensory neurons. The second has to do with their stomach. Essentially, birds have different enzymes in their stomach, and so they break down the capsaicin in a different way than us or other mammals do. All right, I could go on and on. I definitely went down the rabbit hole with researching and exploring, but let's get to experimentation and dig a little bit more into the chemistry and molecular structure behind capsaicin. In particular, we're going to look at capsaicin's polarity because it helps show both how we get spice and how we get relief from spice. To do this, we're actually going to show you a lab designed by someone else, Vayu Mani Rectal, and we've linked the lab below. So in this lab, you saute peppers in oil and in water. The original lab uses butter, which does taste better, but we chose oil here just to keep the molecular formulas simple and easy, and it's the same principles. After sauteing them in the oil and water, you strain out the peppers and immediately will notice the oil and water separate out into their layers. This is due to polarity. Water is polar and oil is nonpolar, so they don't like to mix. We often describe nonpolar substances as hydrophobic, meaning they don't mix well with water. Hydro means water, phobic means fear or aversion. Okay, now here's the whole point of why we did this. 
where did the capsaicin go? Is it in the oil layer, the water layer, or both? Well, there's only one way to find out, which is tasting each layer. The oil layer will have significantly more spice than the water layer. So what do you think the reason is behind this? Well, it's all due to the polarity again. Capsaicin is nonpolar, so it's also hydrophobic and doesn't like to mix well with water. And instead, it mixes with substances similar to it, so that nonpolar oil. Figuring out if something is polar or nonpolar is pretty complex. Here are some quick tips and tricks we think are helpful when trying to look at a molecule and determine its polarity. So let's take a look at the molecular structure of oil. We see lots of carbon and hydrogen atoms, and in particular, we see a really long chain of carbon atoms. That whole chain is nonpolar, and that's what makes oil nonpolar. So generally speaking, if we see a long chain of carbons and hydrogens, we know that that's nonpolar. Now, if you Google a molecule like oil, you're likely to see different depictions of the molecule. These two things are basically the same thing. The one on the right-hand side is just a shorthand where all of the carbons are just each point, and then the hydrogens are understood that they're bonded off of the carbon. So it's the same. Now, let's take a look at capsaicin. What do you notice immediately? We should see that long chain again, and that helps explain why capsaicin is nonpolar and thus attracts the substances similar to it, like the oil. Another big hint to determining if something is polar or not are OH bonds, bonds between oxygen and hydrogen. Let's take a look at water, for example. You see two hydrogen bonds, which means that water is super polar. And so if we see another molecule that has a lot of those OH bonds, there's a good chance it's polar as well and likes water. Now, if you're looking closely, you might see an OH bond in capsaicin, and that's true. But if we look at it in relation to how big the nonpolar section of the whole molecule, you can see that it's a really small portion and ratios matter here. While we think this is a pretty good rule of thumb to go by, there are a lot more complexities and caveats. So this isn't the golden rule. Check out our supplementary materials to go into more depth about polarity. So we decided to experiment with how to relieve spice when you've had a little too much. A couple of reasons why. First, it just seemed practical. Isn't it something you want to know? Two, there is a general consensus based off of studies as well as other experiments, which is that milk is best. However, there's not really a consensus as to why, but a lot of the theories are all about polarity, which I was totally geeking out about and wanted to explore more. So why is milk so effective? Here's the theory in a nutshell. And if you want to dig into the details, don't worry. We've linked all the resources and studies below so you can look at them. A number of scientists believe that milk may be particularly effective in mitigating spice due to its nonpolar molecules. See, there it is. Now, there are two main nonpolar molecules in milk. We have fat particles, which are actually pretty similar to the oil molecule we just looked at, as well as casein, which is a little bit more unique and is a type of protein in the milk. Now, it's worth noting that there are other parts to milk, like sugar, whey, and water, and all of those are actually polar. And most theories land on either the fat or the casein, those nonpolar molecules, as the key to milk's magic in relieving spice. Essentially, the nonpolar fat or casein may prevent the capsaicin from binding to those receptors on our sensory neurons because the capsaicin will be attracted to those nonpolar molecules instead. See, it's all coming together. So let's test out all the different types of milk. Luckily, I was able to convince some friends to do this wacky test by promising some hot chicken wings. So basically, our participants ate some hot spicy wings, tried out a drink to see how it relieved the spice, and then rated it on a scale of one to five, one being really not effective, five being super effective, and how it relieved the spice. We did a total of eight different trials, either different types of milk or some type of component in milk. <laughs> <laughs> Even if like it's a 
someone who's like, oh, you know what? I can drink this because of combat with spice. No one wants to drink <laughs> this. This is so gross. I think it, I'm, I'm like, I think I'd be fine. Man. Dude, it, it, it worked for me. It's just it's gross. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Give this thing a minus point, I would. I feel bad. I'll feel bad. That was good. Well, I just found out that I better be spicy ones than that. <laughs> First off, quick thanks to Zach, Devin, and Matt for being game for taste testing, and especially Devin because he literally was ready to taste more. So Heavy Cream was the clear winner for everyone. But let's talk through each test, why we did them, and what we saw with our total score. Remember those different components in milk? Well, each test was either trying to isolate one of them or help us with the process of elimination to figuring out which components were most important. The water was a simple control. It had no fats, proteins, or sugars. The almond milk had fats and proteins, but not the exact ones we'd find in dairy milk because casein in particular is a really special protein. The primary difference and the reason for doing skim milk, whole milk, and heavy cream was the amount of fat. It was our way of trying to isolate and look at the importance of the fat particles. And then our last trials, which were definitely wackier, were about looking and isolating different proteins in milk, specifically the casein protein in milk. We did casein protein powder to try and just do casein with no fat. The reason we did ricotta is, well, we've made ricotta before, and basically we're separating out the whey protein from the casein and fat protein. So the ricotta had just the casein and fat, and then we had the leftover whey liquid, which was just water and whey. And then we wanted to do butter, but honestly, I just felt too bad about putting them through all of these trials, so we didn't do it, but I'd like to do that another time. So according to our results, the more nonpolar molecules a substance has, the more effective it will be in combating spice. But we also want to take into account things like taste. Final thoughts. Capsaicin is a pretty cool molecule. I was originally most interested in the chemistry behind it, but it turns out that the biology is pretty cool too. And while there's a lot we know about capsaicin, there's still a lot of unresolved questions and things to be explored. And I certainly enjoyed exploring and experimenting with it in this episode. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. What the heck are you having us do? <laughs> I don't want to do it though. God, man. Matt, you're so <laughs> That is like creamy salt water. <laughs> Wow, thank you. It worked. You have to eat the whole leaf. What? You have to eat the whole leaf. Which one's mine? You have to eat the whole leaf. You have to eat the whole leaf. No, it's not like, oh my gosh, you have mine. You have to eat the whole leaf. What are you talking about? You have to eat the whole leaf. You have to eat the whole leaf. Under my rules, you don't. Everybody watching at home? Yeah. When you're doing this, you have to eat the you whole would, thing. You would literally get unfollowed. Oh my god. Even this, it burns my nostrils. Wait, you didn't get one for yourself? <laughs>